Hello and welcome to the latest Bristol University Press webinar on the future of democracy. I'm sure many of us here believe that democracy needs to improve. Recent political events have given us many examples of why, but it's hard to agree on how. There are many ideas for us to imagine this and turn it into reality, but are they realistic? I'm Catherine King, Marketing Manager at Bristol University Press, and I'm delighted to introduce our speakers, Marcel Bou, author of The Rules of Democracy, which published in June, and Jeff Mulgan, author of Another World is Possible, published by Hearst. Jeff is former head of Prime Minister Tony Blair's strategy unit and chief executive of both the Young Foundation, Think Tank, and the innovation charity, Nesta. He's currently professor of collective intelligence, public policy and social innovation at University College London. He's written extensively on communication, power, strategy and social innovation, including Social Innovation, published by us in 2019. Martial, who's having a few problems joining us at the moment, but he will hopefully be here in a moment, uh, chairs the UK's Institute of Regulation and has been the chief executive of both the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority and the UK Public Health Register. He's former director of the National Audit Office and currently research fellow at the Constitution Unit at University College London, a board trustee of the think tank, tank Demos and a policy advisor to the University of Bath. Jeff and Marcia will each speak about their books and discuss the ideas they have for improving democracy before taking questions from you. Please type the questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and I will put them to them at the end of the session. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We have closed captions enabled on this webinar. There's a button at the bottom of your screen, live transcript. Please use this to show or hide text as you prefer. Details of how to order the books dis under discussion at a discount will be available in the chat too. For Jeff's book, please use the code MOLGAN25 on Hearst's website, which will be in the chat. And for Martial's, use BOO25 on our website. A recording of the webinar will be available after the event. I'm now going to hand over to Jeff. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. And just to say, Martial had joined us, then had a connection problem, and uh, hopefully will find his way uh, back in through cyberspace. Um, just a word of thanks, first of all, to, uh, to Catherine. So as she said, uh, they published my book, Social Innovation, a couple of years ago, which is just out this week in Japanese translation. If you want a, a, a Japanese version or have friends who are Japanese uh, speakers. Uh, but what I'm going to be talking about today is this um, new book, Another World uh, is Possible, which came out a few weeks ago uh, here and in, uh, and in North America. And I'll try and link some of its content to, to what Martial will, will talk about. The, the background for writing the book was uh, a diagnosis that we have a problem, even a crisis of imagination. And this I observed through talking to lots of people from teenage activists, uh, chief executives, politicians to, uh, to NGOs. And the general pattern I found was that people find it quite easy to picture uh, a dark future, ecological catastrophe and climate change. They find it relatively easy to picture what might happen technologically in the future with drones, artificial intelligence and robots, but really struggle to imagine how our main social institutions or political institutions could change and be better a generation or, or more into the future. What would a welfare state look like or a national health service or the everyday workings of parliament? And you can see the symptoms of this in, in our current politics to the extent there is a, a Trussite vision, which we may see at their conference next week. It's a, it's a sort of souped up version of, of, of 80s Thatcherism. Sometimes they present it as Singapore on Thames, but that bears little relation to the real Singapore. Um, but it's a very fuzzy picture of what a desirable future would be and almost nothing to say in that vision of what might happen to, to democracy. Uh, Labour this week um, has had a good conference. It's big idea, great British energy is not a bad idea, but in some ways it's extraordinary that Labour adopting what was a very mainstream idea for mid 20th century Europe, 
that that is treated as something radical, exciting and new. And Labour used to be a great pioneer of social and political thinking. And in a way, this is a, a symptom of just how much imagination has squeezed down. I argue in the book, this in some ways links to a wider pessimism, majorities in many countries who now expect their children to be worse off than them. And I try to analyze why this is different from the past, why you wouldn't have seen a similar picture 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, when there was in many ways much more vital and vibrant imagination of what might be possible uh, in the future. I put some of the blame on the parties themselves, who at certain times had strong teams within the main parties whose job it was to think uh, ahead. And those have largely been replaced by communications experts. Uh, and indeed, Liz Truss's number 10 is a classic of that, where the main job seemed to be with lobbyists and PR people. And I also criticize the universities who, for rather different reasons, have given up on this task of generating creative options for the future. Uh, and for quite understandable reasons, have focused much more instead on an, either analysis of the present or past or just uh, critique. And I try in the book to look at lots of examples globally, the different imaginaries from China and India to Africa and the West, and crucially, what methods we could use to revive our ability to, to imagine, to imagine a future uh, care system or public libraries or parks or, 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 or welfare. I won't talk about that at all, but instead to link to, to Martial's book, to focus on the elements around democracy. Uh, which I see as absolutely part of the problem we have here. Our democracy was essentially uh, crystallized in the 18th and 19th century, uh, a model where you vote for uh, a small number of political parties who have representatives in a parliament which sits in the capital. There are elections every four or five years, there are programs uh, and so on. And then a rather formulaic uh, set of ways of um, uh, debating or making laws in the House of Commons. Now, there's nothing, again, wrong with any of that in the 19th century. That was a fantastic advance over most of the alternatives. But what's extraordinary is how little that has changed, even while almost every aspect of our life has changed, including, you know, the fact we're doing this sort of uh, event uh, online. And around the world, you can see just how different democracy could be. Um, even in Wales and Scotland, which had to create new assemblies after devolution, they've done so in ways totally different from uh, Westminster and with a style and a tone and a physical structures which feel much more adult than uh, a lot of what happens certainly in the House of Commons. Um, I work a bit in Taiwan, which has gone further than anywhere in mobilizing collective intelligence methods to rethink democracy, methods where large numbers of of the, the public can take part in proposing policies, shaping policies, tapping into uh, expertise of all kinds as part of the democratic process, even though the ultimate decisions are still made by elected representatives and ministers. And we got a slight flavor of that here at the beginning of the pandemic when Parliament Post asked for experts to offer their, their expertise to help uh, us make decisions through the pandemic. And I think almost 20,000 uh, people signed up to be, as it were, uh, part of expert groups to help policy decision making. Of course, the government didn't really know how to use that. It was such a, a radically different way of working. Europe has had extraordinary experiment around citizens assemblies from Ireland to Germany and France. And a lot of work is happening to try and, I think, refine exactly how a citizen assembly can make usable, useful recommendations, whether on big moral issues or, or more strategic ones like climate change. And I'm also interested in how we might reshape some of the ways Parliament works to perhaps discourage some of the worst aspects of, of politics. I do a lot of work at the moment on science and the interrelationship between science and uh, political and governmental decisions. And there is a proliferation of, of committees and science advisory mechanisms of all kinds. I'm part of one in the European Parliament. 
But why don't we go further? Why not have real-time fact-checking as politicians are speaking in a parliament? So if a claim is made within a minute on a screen, you know, you see a, a, a check whether that claim is actually accurate. Uh, why not ensure that around any debate there are um, you know, curated bodies of relevant materials, of written materials, websites, uh, uh, videos, and so on, rather than the incredibly anachronistic method still used by inquiries or committees where they only take note of evidence which has been submitted to them, either verbally or in writing. An extraordinary method to use in the year 2022. And there's much else which we could reimagine about our democracy all the way down to the very, very local level where some countries have much more participatory budgeting at the local level to allocate money for public spaces all the way up to the global uh, level. How do you involve several billion people in a dialogue about the world's priorities? So to me, it's vital that we do encourage imagination not so as to then impose the results of imagination top down, perhaps in the way that sometimes happened in the 20th century, not always for the best, but rather in order to generate options which can then be tested out, experimented with and improved. And the alternative, I think, is basically stagnation. If you don't imagine, change, innovate, then it's not surprising your democracy comes to feel like it's stuck in a previous era, like it generates bad politicians and bad decisions. And for me, the key thing is to treat democracy not as something fixed and finished, but rather as a work in progress, not as something dead, but rather as a living thing, as something which you know we all depend on massively for the quality of our own lives, as we've seen this week with the rather disastrous uh, events of a few days ago. So I hope that's a little bit of a, a, a kickoff and um, it's good to see Martial in at least two dimensions with us now. So maybe I could just hand over straight over to you. Thank you so much, Jeff, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm sorry I was a bit late. I had unstable internet connection in this office that I am. Uh, um, I've uh, imposed myself into this office to uh, to talk to you today, um, and it's always uh, great to um, to hear Jeff um, because there are very few people, in my view, who think as broadly about social problems and potential solutions as Jeff does. And uh, obviously that makes it slightly daunting for me to come after him, but, but he's absolutely right in his book um, about the importance of imagination for us to be thinking ahead, not just about today's problems and sorting out the small things that we come across a day to day, but some of the bigger longer term problems that we're facing, whether that's uh, the environment or a global trade, or obviously the pandemic, which forced us to think in a very novel and real way about the scale of the challenges and the multifaceted dimensions that they have and the way that they impact on all kinds of governments and public services. So, so it's great that, uh, that Jeff is, is throwing down the gauntlet and asking us to think creatively and imaginatively about these problems and to come up with solutions. Um, and in, uh, in the area that I uh, worked in for a few years as the chief executive of IPSA, the MP's uh, spending watchdog, I got to see democracy at very close quarters, regulating MPs and their spending. Um, and I've picked up the gauntlet in, a, in, that, in that area and, and, and conducted a little bit of a, a what if challenge on myself, which is to think, what if uh, democracy were to improve? What if democracy were to be a living, evolving thing um, in the way that Jeff just said, rather than something that with rules and procedures that were set up 150 or, or more years ago. Democracy has evolved uh, in the, uh, since the Industrial Revolution, but, um, but the scale of the challenge that we face at the moment, and, and Jeff's just articulated some of the ways in which uh, democracy can change and we can think about new, new ways of governing ourselves, how can we make sure that, uh, that um, democracy is fit for purpose for the 21st century and beyond? Um, and in conducting that what if experiment, I was given assurance by the fact that we've done it before. The Industrial Revolution, uh, it, um, going back 150 years, is a time when democracy uh, really took big strides forward, whether in the UK or in Australia or, or other places. And 
it was re in response to the major social challenges that were taking place at the time. Industrialization, obviously, but the urbanization that accompanied it, the changing working practices, the changing family dynamics, changing size of families. In, in multiple ways, society changed and democracy needed to respond because it was no longer feasible for cities like Leeds or Manchester not to have elected representatives and for pocket boroughs in Cornwall to have two. Um, so democracy did evolve. It wasn't easy. There were all kinds of uh, great reform acts, as I'm, I'm sure many people know, that led to um, reforms of constituencies, direct representation, uh, the expansion of the franchise to working men and ultimately to women too. Um, the creation of an electoral commission, uh, rules on, on, on secret ballots. All of these kind of innovations took place um, in response to the Industrial Revolution. And today we're facing a similar scale of social challenge. We've got a global world that we've never experienced in, this, in the same way before. And we've got technology, which makes it absolutely evident that we are living on one planet and we share global resources and global problems, whether that's uh, financial systems or global trade or the environment or, or a pandemic. And so we've got to come up with new solutions for the way that we govern ourselves. And, and that was the challenge that I, that I set myself, confident in the knowledge that we've done it before. Um, and I've postulated some ideas uh, which, um, which may not ever be practical or happen, but in the spirit of uh, just challenge for us to imagine what a future might be, what might be. In, in the book that I've written, um, I, I throw out six ideas for us to think about so that we can think about uh, better ways of governing ourselves in the world that, uh, that exists today, not the world that exists 30, 40, 50 years ago. The first of those is to think about a democracy decision-making really on behalf of us all as a global system. It's not no longer uh, feasible to have a kind of Westphalian nation state model that, uh, that worked reasonably well for hundreds of years. We, we've got to understand that we're in a global system. And so that does require us not only to have local democracy and national democracy, regional democracy in some cases as well, but some kind of global democracy as well. The systems that we've got in place for making decisions at an international level are inadequate. They were created in 1945 and they're no longer really fit for purpose for the global age because there's, there's no accountability really for the decisions that are taken in, in any democratic sense. Um, and many, many of the many billions of the people in the world are not represented at the decision making table. So, so that's that's one. Number two is about taxation, because uh, it's often forgotten that that all of these things that we, we talk about, public services, education, health, defense, uh, they're all funded by our own taxes. And yet we have almost zero visibility of how our taxes are taken and how they are spent. In the modern world where at a touch of a screen, we're able to see our own personal finances, it should be very possible, tricky, but possible to do the same for our tax spending. Um, there are all kinds of issues with that in terms of um, how decisions are made and, uh, uh, and the feasibility of doing that. But, uh, but there does need to be a radical rethink in my view about the connection between the amount that we spend and what we get for our money. And we might be able to make more informed decisions or certainly influence um, politicians to make more informed decisions about how we actually want our money spent. And um, third, uh, politicians themselves, um, they, they do need to be better uh, held to account. Uh, we've seen over the last few years that it's, it's too easy for politicians of all uh, colors and all countries to make promises uh, and to think that they can say whatever they please um, and they won't be held to account until an election when most people may have forgotten what they said and, and will be voting on a, on a, on a far right wider range of issues. Um, there, are, there, there are ways in which politicians can be better held to account. Select committees can be strengthened in, in Parliament. They're, they're a very effective way of uh, account holding. Uh, but also there are other models that we can think about, like in business, the um, businesses are only able to advertise things that they can back up with evidence. They can't say that uh, uh, some cream is going to make us younger or healthier if it doesn't. There must be ways in which politicians similarly can, uh, can be held to account for what they say so they can't just make it up as they go along. 
not straightforward, but it, it but it must it must be possible. Um, next, public services themselves. Um, there's all kinds of ways in which they they can improve, uh, but it's a hard thing to do with limited budgets, and those and those problems aren't going to go away. So so in addition to the accountability that they have for spending money properly. I think it's also important for them to be accountable for sharing their knowledge and good practice so that so that learning that take place takes place in Salford or in Brighton can quickly spread to other parts of the country so that uh, all public public bodies that are working towards um, uh, beneficial outcomes for us uh, can consider themselves to be part of the same uh, ecosystem and work, working effectively together by being obliged to share information and good practice about. Uh, we also have an obligation to our community. Um, I think it's important that we think that we're not just uh, subjects of being of delivery, that public services are delivered to us. We do need to participate in them and participate also in the health of our democracy. And, and, and one of the ways in which we might think about doing that is to have compulsory voting or, a, or an expectation that we vote, for example, an expectation that we contribute to our communities in one way or another. It happens in many countries, including Australia. Um, it, we may want, there is a role for regulators. Regulators are, are, are play a role of referees. Democracy needs to be refereed as well. Um, I, I, I used to run a, a democratic regulator in IPSA. There are others as well, the Electoral Commission, Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards. These bodies uh, play an important role in safeguarding the health and the standards of our democracy on behalf of us all. Um, and it's important, I think, that these organizations should um, be strengthened so that they can play that role effectively. As I say, these are uh, responses to the challenge that Jeff has set. Um, thinking uh, imaginatively, I hope, about some of the ways in which democracy can evolve to recognise the challenges that we faced over the last uh, 20 to 30 years and, and the fact that the world is not the same as when democracy last evolved in response to the Industrial Revolution. Fantastic, Martial. So shall we try and sort of disagree um, bitterly on over this? Uh, I suspect we don't. Um, so maybe I might just kick off with a few comments on what you've just said i mean one starting point which neither of us mentioned but we should is there's pretty strong evidence around the world of declining confidence in democracy by age that's to say each generation seems to have less belief in it as a system of government and you can see this in some countries in the voting patterns for authoritarian populist parties actually is more young than old. In some countries, it's, it's, it's the old, but in many, it's actually now the young voting for uh, leaders who can claim they'll cut through the mess of democracy and get stuff to, to happen. This is what one reason why it is so urgent to, to remake democracy. And it does require some patience. Um, you have six six demands, as it were, the Chartists who had, I think, one of the biggest ever demonstrations in British history, a million people meeting in Kennington in 1848. They had six demands um, and it took decades for their demands to be achieved, like universal. In fact, it was male, male suffrage, paying politicians and so on. But, you know, it set a marker. We need equivalents, which, you know, set set the markers of what we need to achieve a generation or two from now. I think some of the things you've described should be relatively easy. I mean, it still amazes me that we don't get from the government each year a breakdown of where our tax goes. You do get that sometimes from local councils, but I've certainly never received anything from national government. And there's lots of evidence which shows that people don't really know where their money goes there. It, it, it appears completely opaque, a black hole the tax system, and that is just foolish. It wouldn't be all that hard to get every public service to have a duty to share not only lessons of what works, but also their data, and that would have to include commercial contractors, so the whole system uh, could learn. Um, I favour as well academies for politicians. It seems amazing they are was well, the only profession which isn't trained at all. Um, there are bits of this in elsewhere. Australia recently set up a very well-funded academy for politicians with a very good curriculum. 
Uh, 10 days ago, I took part in an event for about 100 European MPs. Again, a sort of mutual training exercise. And as far as I can see, British MPs get almost nothing and really are not well equipped to cope with things like financial crises or pandemics or climate change. There is a basic sort of competence and knowledge gap there where their backgrounds often in law or economics or in trade unions just don't prepare them for the kind of issues they're, they're dealing with. So those are quite easy things to fix. The one which is much harder, well, and compulsory voting, personally, I think if once it's electronic uh, and uh, it shouldn't be too too unreasonable to require people to vote, but uh, we can leave that one to one side. The hardest one, I think, is the transnational one and how in practice you organize democracy, whether at the level of 450 million people in Europe or you know, seven, eight billion people at the level of the world. The UN a few years ago did a big consultation exercise, which about 10 million people did take part in. But no one, uh, and obviously the COP exercises and all these new ways of organizing global dialogues like around climate change are experimenting with inclusivity, but they're a very long way from some classic democracy, one person, one vote, or in a sense, the formula. So maybe you might just say a little bit more about that and the, and the say, the, 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 the disjunction between an increasingly interconnected global world and democracy, which is still overwhelmingly national in character. Well, uh, goodness me, uh, Jeff, you're so uh, articulate. Uh, you said it all very, very well. Um, I mean, these challenges are, are, are enormous, obviously, and um, all systems um, are difficult to change because there are so many vested interests in the system as it exists currently. And um, the governance systems that we've got, politics, uh, is particularly prone to that because the people who who reach positions of power it happens in the private sector as well but in in politics they've spent a lot of time glad handing working the room in order to build their networks and to achieve power through the uh, through the decision making structures that exist at the current time so to come along at the end um, and and to say actually now that i've achieved power i'm going to give it away or, 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 or change the way that the power dynamic works it is a really hard thing. It's very, very unusual. You were involved, I know, Jeff, in one of those when um, the Bank of Ind England was made independent in 1997. That was, uh, that was quite exceptional. So, um, so for, uh, for global decision making to take place, uh, it would require not only for nation states to, to give up some of their, their mandate, in effect, um, in the way that we've just seen quite problematic in the EU, but for the United Nations, which is a rather bureaucratic construct now, um, to recognize that it, that it needs to improve its democratic le legitimacy. And um, I, I think that personally, that some of the tools that are in place um, whereby individuals around the world can vote um, electronically or, or otherwise, uh, to be able to do this yet. But, um, but I do believe in representative democracy. I do think that the politicians that I've worked with over the years care very much about the people that they represent. And, um, and that if we could find a way for uh, decision makers at a global level to uh, faithfully represent the views of, uh, of the people in their countries, their territories, then it might be better than a global system which essentially rests on either the power dynamics between Russia, China, and the United States, and perhaps the EU, um, or the um, haggling that takes place in, in the United Nations and its uh, subsidiaries. So, you know, it, it will require a bit, a bit of effort, and there needs to be somebody that wants it to happen, um, which the existing, those with existing powers may be reluctant to, to give up. So, you know, it, it is going to be quite a challenge. And, you know, unfortunately, in the history of, of humanity, it's uh, often been war that has led to uh, changes uh, in the way that um, the, the, the decisions have been made, whether that was uh, the Peace of Westphalia in, in 1648 or the Second World War that led to the creation of the United Nations and, and other organizations. So, so I, I can't happen, but there are people uh, working towards greater uh, democ democracy at a global level, including um, uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the United Nations, 
um, and other mechanisms. But uh, but I don't know the answer to that question, I'm afraid, Jeff. Mm. I, I quite like to comment on a few of the questions in chat, maybe just before before commenting on them, and maybe you can as well. Just one, th one comment on this incumbent issue. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a wave of new political parties grew up around the world, like Five Star in Italy, uh, Podemos in Spain, the Pirate Party. And um, many of them were interested in democratic innovation, slightly crazy ideas often. And I did a couple of exercises in my last job bringing them into the UK, including the parliamentary innovations from places like Taiwan and Brazil and so on. In retrospect, what was stunning is that all the main parties were essentially completely uninterested in borrowing anything from these new parties or these new methods. And I, you know, I knew they'd be a bit resistant, but the, the degree of lack of interest of incumbents who've succeeded in one system to learn from another system, I, I still find remarkable. Uh, and it may that does suggest it's only with some disruption, some real crisis that you get the conditions for necessary uh, change. I mean, just to I'd say very quick comments on some of the questions. First of all, on Paul's, I think a lot of the evidence does show quite a link between sort of interpersonal trust and trust in democracy and, uh, and indeed trust in government. And the, the Scandinavians generally score pretty well on all of those. If you don't trust your neighbor, you're probably not gonna trust the system which reflects all your neighbor's votes either. And there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a nasty uh, spiral many societies get can get into. I think we have a particular challenge in the UK on the local national interface. Uh, I'm doing some work on this at the moment in the lessons from the pandemic, um, where some countries had very good, we call sort of mesh interfaces between national, regional, local government with lots of sharing of knowledge and data and joint discussion. Here, you know, it was, it was a really a struggle to get Whitehall to, cope to talk to to Edinburgh, let alone to Manchester and, and local councils. And this is so clearly a, a failing of our governance system at the moment that I hope, uh, and it's not a very difficult one to fix, but I hope it will be uh, will be attended to. And on Leslie's question, I mean, it, it's been very common to hear in the last 10 or 20 years, only an authoritarian country like China will be able to take the, the bold enough steps to avert climate change. Or, or other challenges. And it's quite an appealing argument, and it was made a lot in the 20s and 30s that democracy is sort of ill-suited to big, difficult decisions involving sacrifice. But I'm not, I, I, it's, I'm not really convinced by it because autocracies can as easily be captured by special interests, they can as easily by, be diverted, they can as easily be short term. And it's very hard to find any really clear pattern in that respect. And the response of democracies to war, to Ukraine, is a reminder that when push comes to shove, actually democracies are very good at organizing themselves and doing very tough things if, if existence is at, uh, is at stake. And, you know, that every major, you know, war between major powers has always been won by the democracy, not by the autocracy. Uh, for that reason. So I think it's quite it's quite a dangerous line of argument. And that's why my vote would be for trying to reform democracy rather than hoping that some mythical autocrat leader will do the things we hope that they might do. But Marcia, what do you think on that one? <laughs> well, I'm going to violently agree with you uh, on that, Jeff. Uh, I think there's no doubt at all that, uh, that all the costs that um, that people ascribe to democracy in terms of lots of people spending time talking to each other and not coming to decisions and um, it, you know uh, positioning themselves all of that kind of thing this is actually how good quality decisions get made it's by people sharing ideas and and and, and arguing over what's the best way to deal with a complex problem um, it's uh, that there is evidence that better decisions are made when more people are involved in the decision making. And autocracies uh, over time particularly um, get a smaller and smaller group of people who are involved in the decision making because of fear and repression and, mm -hmm. and all kinds of vested interests that uh, kind of gradually get to the closer to the decision making power. And you know uh, this could well be happening with Putin at the moment um, in Russia. Um, 
And, and also, I think it's important to remember that, um, that states that have repressed its people lose, lose a lot of people too. The, the, the Huguenots fled, the, uh, there was mass, mass movement of people during the Second World War, where, where countries that had dictatorships denuded themselves of expertise and talent and creativity and, and solutions to problems that just did not go away. When, uh, when Japan and China in the, in the Middle Ages put up the walls to foreign trade, uh, the trade didn't stop. Um, and so, so I think that the democracy, um, although it's, uh, it can look ugly and um, very dispiriting sometimes, it's actually the, the most efficient way for us to make collective decisions across a large, complex, diverse set of people. In the same way that financial transactions um, between individuals um, create the market, they, they fire the economy. The, 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 the votes, the, the conversations that take place in democracy enable those people who are responsible for making decisions to do the best they can in, in complex circumstances. And arguably also, although again, it looks very messy, the changes that have taken place in the UK over the last six to 10 years actually represent a way for the, the, the British people to, um, to, to enable the decision makers to be more responsive to the needs. So, uh, so one prime minister uh, was forced to go, another prime minister came, and then there was, you know, it's not, it, it, it's, a, it's a little bit facile to say that this is, uh, that this is democratic because clearly there's a, there's a, there's a lot to be uh, left to be desired really in the way that that happened. However, however, um, the election of Donald, Donald Trump and then the election of Joe Biden um, does also um, enable people to express their frustrations and to, to respond to the changing times. So, so in response to Joe's question, um, you know, the emotion does matter and people voted for Donald Trump, they voted for Brexit, they voted for um, Obama. You know, uh, we need to respect people's choices and do our very best to, uh, to help um, not just the politicians to make the decisions that represent the people that they're representing, but also for the systems and the institutions that they're overseeing to act as a check on uh, some of the more wayward suggestions that they may come up with, because we need both the stability of uh, and the continuity of institutions and structures and laws, and we need the responsiveness of democratically elected politicians to be able to, to help us to change with the times. Yeah, maybe just a brief comment on, on Joe Warner's question as well, perhaps before Catherine then takes over. I, I think this question of how you as well organize emotion and feelings in politics is really important and quite, quite difficult. On the one hand, a kind of purely rational technocratic version of politics is never going to work for many people. Politics should be where you have feelings, hopes, fears, identities, all those things which make us human. But we're in a moment when the social media environment has massively amplified those in really unhealthy ways, uh, where business models have encouraged the, you know, say the amplification of, of hate or uh, of anger uh, and so on. And one of the things happening in some of the democratic innovation debates, like in, in places like Taiwan, is trying to explicitly have stages where you can so sort of show your feelings, you can, as it were, put on the table the emotional dimension of decisions, as well as perhaps the more analytic and rational ones. But I don't think we, we're there yet. And I think there's, there's a sort of missing task of democratic redesign to fuse, in a way, the, the emotional and the more detached and, and rational. And if, there, if anyone's got good examples of doing that, both of those at the once, uh, it'd be interesting to hear them. Catherine, are you going to yeah, moderate? Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you very much to both of you. That was absolutely fascinating. I almost feel like you don't need me. You could have carried on without me. But anyway, there are some questions in the uh, question and answer that I feel that I should put to you as people have kindly uh, posted them. So perhaps we could just uh, spend a few minutes answering some of those. Um, first of all, from David Farnsworth, he says there are lots of ideas around uh, citizens' assemblies, PB, neighbourhood planning, etc. But how do we get from here to there when most politicians do not want to lose power? Can I ask you first, Jeff, and then Marcel perhaps afterwards? Yeah, it's difficult for exactly the reasons you said. And mainly these new methods have been brought in by new parties or after a sort of disruption to 
uh, the, the old uh, system. So in a country like Britain, which has a very rigid to an a bit party system, at least in, in England, um, these are going to be resisted unless there is a, a, a you know, a really strong movements for them. Um, my hope is some of this may happen bottom up. So individual mayors may see advantages for them in introducing neighborhood governance, participatory budgeting. That's what's happened in cities like Paris, where it's been led by or Barcelona led by uh, the mayors with national government not involved uh, at all. And hopefully, or, or in, like in Ireland, where citizens assemblies in a way came again from outside the orthodox political system as a way to resolve long standing issues with the presidency having a uh, playing a rather unusual role in in the political system. But it's uh, you're, I, I, I see little prospect of the, the heart, the core leaderships of the main parties having any appetite for any of these things at all for exactly the reason you said. Marcia? Yeah, I, I agree. I do agree, I'm afraid. But, um, but uh, it is also the case that although it doesn't function as a, as a market with the kind of responsiveness that firms um, demonstrate when there's uh, when there's innovation in the marketplace and they copy and they compete. Um, it is also the case that uh, democratic ideas evolve in, in different parts of the world, different parts of the country, and they are copied. So uh, Jeff's absolutely right to highlight the role of mayors. That's a really great innovation. And um, mayors will be watched to see what they do and, and innovations that they come up with will spread. And in the same in the same way, at a at a macro level, democracy can evolve. In South Australia, in the late nineteenth century, um, they there was a, a very enterprising official who came up with the idea of the secret ballot rather than having a show of hands when um, uh, people were elected. And um, and for years, decades even, it was called the um, the Australian method, I believe it was called, mm. of of electing people. But now it's standard practice. So it takes a lot longer, but these innovations do spread. And, and I hope very much that now that we are in a globalized world, a, a technologically enabled world, we will be able to spot some of these innovations that work, whether it's participatory budgeting or, or other forms of engagement in the decision making pro process. So that new politicians, when they come into power, whether it's whether it's uh, uh, the new Labour government in 1997 or Macron when he came into power in France, and they uh, destabilise the existing system, they have an opportunity to implement some of these innovations that they've that they've worked on in opposition, as it were, and then they and then they can implement when in power. Yeah, and maybe just throw in one other bit of this, which uh, Marcel earlier mentioned the role of evidence. I help run a thing called the International Public Policy Observatory, so it'll very much live this world of synthesising evidence for governments. And when I'm being optimistic, I would argue there has been a steady growth of institutions, which almost force politicians to look at the evidence as, as they're making decisions. Uh, and a good example of that until last week was the Office of Budget Responsibility, which commented on government's fiscal decisions in a arm's length way to try and avoid the sort of really stupid <laughs> decision we had made last week. Uh, and we've got similar ones in health, we've got similar ones beginning in education, in many fields, in a way, the mobilization of that sort of expertise, collective intelligence in that form, as part of the democratic process, is becoming stronger over time. And if I'm optimistic, I would hope that in 30, 40 years time, it will just be obvious that any decision as a matter of course, happens alongside a synthetic mobilization of the best available knowledge from around the world about what works or what doesn't. Uh, and hopefully one good result of the last week is that another ch chancellors won't do budgets without an OBR commentary for quite a while to come. Let's hope not, no, absolutely. Um, so changing the subject and moving on to Ken Peterson's uh, question, instead of enforced voting, would it not be better to make voting more worthwhile? In the UK and the US, only two real choices exist, and finance means that's all that can. There's been no mention of proportional representation, which would allow at least votes for small parties without the wasted vote feeling. Uh, Marcia, do you want to comment first? Oh, goodness. Well, there's a whole theology, isn't there, about um, uh, voting methodologies. I mean, I, I, I obviously I, I accept the point, and we've seen in Scotland uh, that we have put in, in place different uh, ways of voting for our elected representatives and for when we were in, in the EU similarly. Um, 
but uh, but again, parties need to see the point of, of doing that so that they can put that to us. And uh, and sometimes, um, you know, it's hard for us as voters, citizens, to understand the mechanics of voting systems. And you know, we do need to understand that we're going to get somebody to represent us. Um, even even with the, the system that we've got in place, the first past the post system we've got, I do believe that votes count. And um, and we saw that, we've seen that at least twice in a very significant way over the past few de decades. Um, first uh, with the votes for the Greens and second with the votes for UKIP. In both cases, um, the main parties saw the surge in votes for the Greens or UKIP and they, and they trimmed their sales in order to capture those people. So, so it was as a result of people voting for smaller parties, in part, that some of the main parties decided to try to adopt their policies in order to capture their votes. So, so you know, although that's an indirect way in which um, which people can influence the decision making process, it, it does still matter. But I but I but I know uh, that there's an enormous amount that could be said about changing um, the methodology for making votes. Jeff, would you like to add something? Uh, I'm I'm fairly agnostic about different electoral reform models. I, I think it was good that Scotland and Wales went for a different model than we were used to. And uh, I mean, I do a lot of work in Scandinavia, which you know, always ha usually anyway has coalitions which are fairly healthy. But you do if you go for a, a PR of some kind, you are bound to get a much stronger extreme right. Um, uh, voice in your politics, and you may get some other, uh, you know, um, uh, extremes uh, gaining more, more, more say, more influence, etc. So the dynamics are, are quite un are somewhat unpredictable, and they don't all point to sort of wise consensus reason, which I think many of the advocates of PR sort of have in their mind. Uh, an assumption that that's what, that's what will happen. I mean, the Labour conference, I think, this week did actually vote for PR. Um, uh, against the wishes of the leadership. And, you know, if there is one moral of politics always, and, and Italy was yet another example of this last week, it's the side which is united defeats the side which is divided. I mean, in Italy, the, the you know, the, the, the right actually got a lower share of the vote this time than in other elections, but because they were united, they've won a massive majority. So um, either you have to do that through electoral pacts or through parties adapting quickly enough to pressure, as Marcel said, or uh, you, you have to do it through the voting system. And in Britain, it's just a, a, a sort of a, a fact of history that the centre left has been generally very bad at uniting and doing deals with itself. And the right has been much more ruthless about taking and keeping power, even when it's in a minority position. Right. I think we've got time for maybe two or three more questions. If you could try and keep your answers short, and we can get through a few more. Um, Stuart Reid says he likes the idea of an academy for MPs. Leadership, including political leadership, is an activity and one that can be practiced and learned. Why focus on just MPs, though? What do the speakers think about the well-funded regional or sub-regional academies that develop leadership across systems and bring together MPs, charities, churches, unions and individuals? The Kansas Leadership Centre offers a model like that working across their state. Uh, Jeff, can I come to you first? Yeah, I, I didn't know about the Kansas one and I will look that up. I, I've been involved in quite a few different um, leadership academies. At one point, we tried creating one for ministers. In fact, in the, the Labour government of the early 2000s, there was a training program for ministers because often they'd get a ministerial job with no background at all in how government worked. In China, there's very extensive training for mayors, uh, governors, ministers. I actually lecture at their academy for ministers who have to do two weeks residential training every year. Even the president has to learn. Um, uh, the US set up the, the Bloomberg Mayors Program, which trains 50 mayors across the world each year. Quite a few of the British mayors have been on that. So there are examples, and it definitely shouldn't only be MPs. I agree with you there. But as someone earlier put in the chat, you know, MPs are the highest paid unskilled workers in the country. And it is insane to run politics like that when they're having to make judgments on such complex systemic issues which are so far be be beyond their, their experience or knowledge. And it still slightly baffles me why parliament and government doesn't invest at least some resources in, in a little bit of light touch training for them. And say the, the, the McKinnon Institute in Australia is a really good example of a new approach to this. 
Marcia? Uh, well, very briefly, I agree that it would be wonderful. Um, I'll, give, I'll just give a little anecdote uh, by way of illustration. When I was uh, running IPSA, the expenses watchdog, um, I, I talked to every single new MP in batches, in party batches, uh, to talk to them about financial management because they'd been elected, they, had a, they needed to have a budget, they needed to spend that public money properly, um, and they needed to understand how to claim expenses within the rules. None of them were interested. They'd just been elected, they were really excited, they're often very tired, um, and they didn't see their job as being as having to run uh, an office and to manage a budget. Um, similarly, with the efforts that have been made repeatedly over the last decade or so to, um, to train MPs in, in standards of behaviour, running their offices in a way that, uh, that, that all employers have to do in order to comply with the law and the Equality Act, indeed. So, um, so you know, MPs don't really like to do it, and that you know, it, it's something that if we were to try to set up, it would need to be um, not just compulsory, really, but understood by the MPs themselves that this will help them to do their jobs better and potentially help them to get uh, re-elected. But I think it's a challenge. Or maybe not just re-elected, maybe you shouldn't be able to become a junior minister until you've got a little bit of CPD under your belt. Well, that's <laughs> a good idea. But politics gets in the way, though, doesn't it, Jeff? It, it certainly does. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> OK, I'm going to come to our final question now, because um, we're running out of time. Um, Janet Meehan says, can I assume that both speakers would like to abolish the monarchy? Who'd like to go first? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm um, I'm going to I'm going to say uh, for, on the on the one hand that um, you know it's important for every country to respect its its traditions. You know this country has long, long monarchical traditions, and uh, the royal family is part of of what many many people consider themselves to be when they when they say that they're British. So, so I think that the, you know that is important to respect. You know, in a democratic way, and we've seen over the last few weeks, lots and lots of people uh, feel very sad about the death of the Queen, um, and and feel warm towards the royal family. But you know, uh, also it's the case that we are a um, a democracy, and that Parliament is sovereign, and that um, that uh, it's it's not really. Um, consistent with the 21st century for us to have a very lo large extended royal family with a lot of power. So, so you know, they may not have a lot of power constitutionally, um, but it is, but I would, I would certainly like to see our democratic structures, the people that we elect, debate such issues so that they can make changes that are right for the country rather than necessarily stick with what we've had for a thousand years. I found it quite strange the last few weeks how much of the media described Charles as the new sovereign, because as Martial said, since the 17th century, Parliament has been sovereign and they cut the king's head off to make that point. Uh, and that's the system we have. And the, so the, part, the, the monarch cannot do anything without you know, Parliament's uh, approval. I think we may be due some innovations. A long time ago, I actually proposed that a new monarch should face a confirmatory referendum, um, and if they didn't, pass, if they didn't get a majority, then you know someone else would be a candidate. And I actually think that'd be quite good for the monarchy. Uh, it would force them, uh, and Charles, I suspect, would quite easily win a confirmatory referendum now. But it would signal that we're in a new era where it's not just hereditary which gets you the legitimacy to be a monarch, there needs to be popular support as well. I think that is de facto true. I don't think a monarch could survive with massive public opposition, as in somewhere like Thailand right now. Um, but as far as I'm aware, no, I, I was once denounced on the front page of the Evening Standard for this idea of the confirmatory referendum. So uh, maybe we're not quite ready for that sort of idea yet. But a little bit of creativity on the part of the royal family themselves might not be, uh, might be in order. Oh, that's really interesting. It's been a really fascinating discussion. Thank you so much to both of you. And thanks to everybody who's joined us today at this Bristol University Press webinar. And um, particular thanks to Jeff and Marcel, our speakers. Uh, details of how to order their books are, have been in the chat and will also be sent to you after the event in an email, um, along with details of the next Bristol University Press webinar. 
there will be a recording available of the webinar, which will also um, be sent to you and to anybody else who registered but wasn't able to join us today. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank Thanks you everyone for joining. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.